today, we're going to be starting Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. You'll recall that I said in our introductory remarks that Revelation chapter 1 uh, deals with Christ's work in the church, and that Revelation chapters 2 and 3 deal with Christ's word to the church. There are seven churches that are the subject of the book of Revelation. Today, we begin by looking at the first one, the church at Ephesus, with a message I've entitled, Hot Doctrine, Cold Hearts. Hot Doctrine, Cold Hearts. John, much like he will do with all of the churches here, will start a specific format and pattern as he deals with the churches. Uh, in verse 1, we will see that he addresses the church in terms of which particular church it is out of the seven. In verses 2 and 3, he will give a commendation. In verses 4 through 6, he will give a correction. And then finally, he will close with in verse 7, the charge. So we have the church, the commendation, the correction, and the charge. So let's begin by looking at the first verse here in terms of the church. John is writing to address, by direction of the Lord himself, the pastor and the church at Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. So the church at Ephesus here, you'll recall, uh, was a, a very good church in terms of its doctrine and its theology. I have often, uh, those of you who have been around the class for a while, equated like our class with the church at Ephesus. Um, because, for example, if you compare them to what you find in the Corinthian church with a lot of them, the, uh, the immaturity that was going on there, uh, we don't necessarily find that in the church at Ephesus. Uh, Paul established this church in Ephesus on his second missionary journey in A.D. 52. Uh, that's covered in Acts chapter 18, verse 19. He spends three years at the church teaching. He starts out there at the synagogue. He's uh, then asked to leave the synagogue, and so he goes next door to the school of Tyrannaeus, where he uh, begins to teach uh, the Jews and those who are Gentile Christians who become believers there. Uh, and so he does that for a period of three years. When he writes back to the church at Ephesus in A.D. 60, uh, he writes, much like he does in all of his other epistles, in terms of writing a letter, which can be divided into two sections, the first being doctrine and the second being application. For example, when Paul writes back to the church at Ephesus, um, fundamentally, the letter deals with Christ and the church. That is, the first three chapters, because there are six chapters to the book of the Ephesians, the first three chapters deals with the believer's position in Christ, and chapters 4 through 6 deal with the believer's practice in Christ. For example, in chapter 1, Paul talks about the big picture of God's sovereign plan and purpose, in that uh, whom God chooses, he redeems and he seals. And then when he gets to chapter 2, he deals specifically with Jew and Gentile being in one body that we were dead in trespasses and sins and that God made us alive. Uh, we were saved by grace and that now in chapter 3, Jew and Gentile are to be viewed as being one body. And that's his doctrine. And then in chapters 4 through 6, he deals with the practical application of the doctrine he just mentioned. He talks about our walk and that it should be worthy of our calling that we are to walk in love and be filled with the Spirit, and that we should put on the full armor of God that we may take our stand against the devil in the day of his attack. Paul's intent is really no different than what we see from the other apostolic writers uh, or any of the other Pauline epistles, in that Paul views the Bible as the Word of God and that it is to be uh, taught 
by the elders of the church that people are to listen and apply it with a result that they become spiritually mature. And so sound teaching, sound teaching presupposes, now don't miss this list, but sound teaching presupposes a very good knowledge of the English Bible for those of us who live in the Western culture. It also requires for those who teach the Bible, and I'm talking about those who are pastor, teachers, elders, and so forth, to have a working knowledge of the Greek and the Hebrew, uh, that they know church history, that they are familiar with apologetics, that is the art uh, and discipline or science of defending the faith. Uh, They are to be skilled and be schooled in uh, theology, both systematic and biblical and historical theology, that they have a firm grasp of practical ministry, namely discipleship and counseling, uh, that they engage in the spiritual disciplines and they teach others how to engage in the spiritual disciplines as well. That's what all of the people who poured themselves into the life of the Ephesian church, that's what they did. Now, many of you might think, well, Paul was the pastor there, and those of you who are really uh, strong Bible students will know that Timothy, after Paul, became the pastor at Ephesus, so that when Paul writes First and Second Timothy, he's writing to Timothy, who's where? In Ephesus. But it was more than just Paul and Timothy. We know that Pr- Priscilla, Aquila, and Apollos, the man with the golden tongue, both poured their lives in teaching ministry into the church. We know that there were followers of John the Baptist, presumably Jewish believers, uh, who came and they poured themselves into the church at Ephesus. Paul himself spent three years there. Young Timothy uh, became the pastor there at Ephesus. Onesphorus was there of Ephesus. Uh, Tychicus was there, who Paul lists as a faithful and loyal preacher. And also, after Paul's demise, John, not John the Baptist, but John the Apostle, the only apostle that was not martyred, John will come to Ephesus and become the pastor of the church at Ephesus. So you're talking about super saints pouring themselves into the lives of this church. And that gave them a church that church a tremendous benefit. And we see that in the commendation of the Lord in verse 2. Jesus commends the church at Ephesus for applying sanctified deeds. Look at verse 2. Jesus said, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance. The word there, know, is not the traditional word that we see in the Bible for know, which would be gnosko, right? This word is the word oida, and it means a perfect and full knowledge that God doesn't have to learn. He looks and he knows, and and Jesus is saying to the church, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance. Well, what kind of work were they doing? MacArthur notes, in the midst of the pagan darkness that surrounded them, They, that is the church at Ephesus, were aggressively evangelizing the lost, edifying the saints, and caring for those in need. Think about Paul when he was there. He said, therefore, I, I, as a prisoner of the Lord, implore you, I beg you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling with which you've been called. That's Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. The word worthy there in that verse means to, to bring scales to the balance of God's justice. It it means to be worthy, or worthiness means that one's behavior should be reflective of God's call on their salvation and in their sanctification. Why? Because their salvation came at Christ's expense. That's what grace means, right? God's riches at Christ's expense. That's why Paul can say, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Watch this, for good works. 
And that's what they were engaging in. They were very bold in the way that they loved each other and the way that they loved the community that they were in, though pagan as it was. Well, not only does Jesus apply, uh, commend them for applying sanctified deeds, but also for their sound doctrine. Look at the latter part of verse 2. Jesus said, And that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you have found them to be false. In other words, this was a church that knew their doctrine. The elders of the church knew their doctrine. The people in the church knew their doctrine. You weren't going to pull the wool over their eye. They weren't going to allow someone to come in and start preaching a prosperity gospel. And most of the time when doctrine becomes unsound doctrine, it generally always has to do with the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. If that gets corrupted, there's going to be 50 other areas in a person's theology that's going to be corrupted. And we'll see later on that the church does become corrupted by this in the form of the te teachings of the Nicolaitans. Uh, but this was not so much the case, at least here in Ephesus, because the minute some other apostles or so-called apostles came in, not real apostles, these were false teachers, and began to teach sound, uh, unsound doctrine, the church knew it immediately and threw them out. Uh, they were so well known for their commitment to the truth that Ignatius, who was the bishop of Antioch, Around 107 writes this, You Ephesians, all live according to truth, and no heresy has a home among you. Indeed, you do not so much as listen to anyone if they speak anything except concerning Jesus Christ in truth. They could immediately recognize false teachers and false teachings. Let me ask you a question. Can you recognize false teaching when you hear it? I mean, they're everywhere. Paul even said, and he warns the elders at Ephesian church, once I leave, ravenous wolves are going to come in. Not one, many. Many. They're everywhere. And they're waiting to fill a gap whenever they can. They're waiting for the opportunity. One of the things that we need to do in terms of being able to discern what is real and what is fake is that we need to become so familiar with the real that whenever the fake stuff comes along, we know it immediately. That's how they train secret service agents, for example. They don't go around looking and trying to find every counterfeit bill that's made under the sun so that they can use it in some type of an examination for the agents. No, what they do is they make the agents so familiar with the real thing that when a false or counterfeit thing pops up, they know it immediately. We need to be like that. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us how we can recognize false teachers. Number one... False teachers teach unbiblical doctrines. Paul, when he writes to 1 Timothy, who is the pastor at Ephesus, so he, by extension, is writing to the church, said this, If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. So what's the premise Paul's using? True teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ and that that teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and whatever form that doctrine takes or that theology takes needs to produce what? Godliness in the church. MacArthur notes, false teachers are not committed to Scripture. They may speak of Jesus, the Father, and the Father, but the heart of their ministry will not be the word of God. They will either add to it, take away from it, interpret it in some heretical fashion, add other revelations to it, or deny it altogether. And that's their plan. That's their motif. That's how they infiltrate the church and begin to influence people by false teaching. How to recognize a false teacher, they teach unbiblical doctrines. Secondly, they teach people to violate God's law. 
Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus and with the doctrine of conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. Watch this. He has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth. All they want to do is talk about those things that they know are controversial. What apologetics form do you follow? Are you a presuppositionalist or are you a classical apologist? Because around here, we only do presuppositionalism. And if you're a classical apologist, we don't want to hear anything that you've got to say. So what they do is they begin to get people fighting against each other on these second order issues that cause strife among the brethren and divides them instead of being concerned about the truth and how these two may be united. They're looking to always cause controversy. MacArthur notes, the end test of any teaching is whether it produces godliness. Teaching not based on scripture will result in an unholy life. Instead of godliness, the loves of false teachers will be characterized by sin creating division, destroying the church. So how do we recognize a false teacher? They teach unbiblical doctrines. They teach people to violate God's law. Third, they are concerned with strife, self-promotion, and personal gain. Back to 1 Timothy 6, Paul writes, He has a morbid interest, that is the false teacher, In controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy and strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and depraved truth, who, watch this, suppose that godliness is a mean of gain. There's the issue. Money involved. To do it for the recognition, to do it for the money. MacArthur notes, false teachers deny the truth and their false teaching does not produce godly living and they serve money, not God. The church must take extreme care not to allow these men to spread their deadly disease. The resulting epidemic would be tragic. And the Ephesians are commended because they're able to avoid this, at least at this moment. But he also commends them for their devotion, their sanctified deeds, their sound doctrine, and also their strong devotion. Look at verse 3. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Now that word perseverance, we've come across that before. It's the Greek word hupomene. And it means steadfastness. The ability to hang in there, stick to itiveness. Because we've said, and Paul is assuming here, that the stick to itiveness, that is, as we're engaging the trials and tribulations of life, produces patience and spiritual growth, that you lack nothing. You all remember that, correct? The formula for spiritual growth. If you forgot it or if you don't know it, you need to memorize it, live it, know it, love it. Because it's true for every single one of us. For any one of us to grow, it takes time plus biblical data plus the application of that data. That is what is produce or produces spiritual growth. If you remove any one of those components, you will not grow. So don't deceive yourself thinking that because you have head knowledge that somehow that equates to spiritual growth. You must also have the application of it. Where's the danger? The danger is you have the capacity to take in knowledge at a greater rate or speed than you have the opportunity to apply it in life. The detriment of that is you begin to think or to fool yourself to thinking that you're much further along than you truly are. 
There's a danger in that. It creates a prideful heart. Jesus is aware of that. That's why, in verse 4, he transitions from the commendation to the correction. Why? Because the Christians begin to play church. The very thing that I told you about is something they begin to engage in. Their doctrine was sound, but they had no practical application of it. Jesus said, and John writes, but I have this against you. You have left your first love. The word here is the word agape, and it means a steadfast commitment to the well-being of another person, regardless of how that person responds back to you. It is not an emotion, though one may feel emotions when one engages in it, but it is an act. It is a volitional choice. And the problem is, is that they had the great doctrine, but they had left their first love for Christ, meaning... They were coming to church, they were discharging a religious duty, you know, seeing the pastor, maybe tipping God a few dollars in the offering plate, singing a few songs, raising their hand, and then going home thinking, okay, I'm done for this week. Jesus rejects that kind of pseudo-worship. As a matter of fact, over in the Gospels, in the book of Luke, Jesus will say this. Why do you call me Lord? People come here and say, oh, we love the Lord. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say to do? You get the idea that he's not happy with people who do that? In John 14, he says, he who has my commandments and keeps them. This is the one who loves me. If I were to go in this church this morning and take a poll, not just in this class, but in the church, how many people in here love Jesus? I'm sure every hand would go up. But when I ask the follow-up question, how many of you are keeping what he says? That is, how many of you are doing what he says do? Because Jesus said, I don't care how much you tell me you love me. If you're not doing what I tell you to do, you don't love me. That's not my opinion. Jesus said in John 14, 24, He who does not love me, what? Does not keep my words. That cuts to the heart. John echoes this in 1 John 4 when he says, If someone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister. The word there is misio, and it means to have an aversion to someone. It doesn't mean you're picking up rocks and throwing at someone else. What it means is that you just have an aversion to other people. Yeah, I come to church, but don't talk to me. Let me sit in the back, drink coffee. And I'm not talking about those of you back there right now. I'm talking about the attitude. Don't bother me. Let me drink my coffee. I'll clap my hands at the preacher, you know. Shake his hand on the way out. See you next week, Doc, you know. Just have an aversion to people. What you're doing is you're cutting off the capacity to love other people. That's what Jesus is talking about. That's what he's concerned with, and that's what John means here. If you love someone less, and yet you say, oh, I love God, God says you're a liar. For the one who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. MacArthur notes, The loss of a vital love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ opened the doors to spiritual apathy, which is where they were. 
Despite its outwardly robust appearance, a deadly spiritual cancer was growing at the heart of the Ephesian church, and it had to be addressed. The Christians needed a change, and we see that Christ gives them the opportunity to make one in verse 5. <clears throat> Therefore, remember, remember where you have fallen, and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you, and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. A lot of people have made a big deal out of repentance in terms of what it means, and I know there have been many, with this, particularly within certain theological movements that really want to get down and try to define what does repentance mean. It's not very difficult. Repentance simply means to change one's thinking. To change one's thinking regarding sin with a view of changing one's attitudes and actions toward that sin. In other words, that should be the natural follow-up to the change of mind or the change of heart. So true repentance brings about a change in behavior. That's why John says, do the deeds that you did at first. Why? Because you're currently not doing it. You're not doing it. Failing to repent brings about God's temporal judgment and discipline. And they were running the risk of engaging in that. We see that in verse 5. Or else I am coming to you and I will remove your lampstand, that is remove the church, out of its place unless you repent. And then very interestingly... Christ does something here in verse 6 that's puzzled many scholars. Because he gives a rebuke, but then he does something to compliment them. You know, they do this in popular media all the time. How many of you remember Dave Ward from Channel 13? You know, for 30 minutes, he's telling me how the city is going to hell in a handbasket, how the country is ablaze, how this world's falling apart, and then at the last you know, a few seconds of each night's broadcast, he would tell you some little quip or, you know, tell you some little joke to leave you laughing, right? Remember, always leave them laughing, always leave them smiling. In a sense, that's kind of what we see here because Christ has just threatened the church to uproot them, to pull them out. And yet by demonstrating an act of grace, he said this, Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, who were these guys? Historians have debated specifically who they were. And to be honest with you, it's probably not important specifically what doctrines they believed, but that we know they believed wrong doctrines, that is, distorting Primarily the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. John Walford, who was president of Dallas Theological Seminary, says this, Whatever the precise nature of this sect, it is noteworthy that a true love for God involves a fervent hate of that which counterfeits and distorts the purity of biblical doctrine. And so that leads us to the final section that we see for the church here at Ephesus, and that is the charge. The charge. Repentance and obedience renders certain benefits. A believer who's backslidden, who's not doing what they're supposed to be doing, when they repent, have a change of mind, a change of heart, and a change of action that yields certain benefits, and that was the same which could be said for the church here. Look at what Jesus said in verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now that word overcome, you might be looking at the transliterated word Nikaio there. It's where we get our English word Nike. And it means to conquer. To conquer. 
There are three various views in terms of what this promise means. Look at it again. He says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, that to him who overcomes. In the Greek text, that is a singular present active participle. We know participles are ing words. It's a present tense verb, and it's in the active voice. So we could translate it this, to the overcoming one, or to the one who is overcoming. That is, you're in process of overcoming. I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, the first view, some people have taken this to mean that, well, right here, Jesus is warning that you can lose your salvation. If you think about the paradise and the tree of, tree of life in the paradise of God, if one fails to overcome, then he or she loses their salvation. However, scriptural evidence makes that abundantly clear that that is not the case. John 6, Jesus said, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and him who comes to me I shall by no means cast out. John 10, 27 my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they will follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me, again, that's a present tense active participle, so the believing one who sent me has active indicative. That's not you may have it, an indicative, and in, the indicative mood assumes the truth of the statement. If you're believing in Jesus, you have eternal life, period. Not maybe, you do. That's not my opinion, that's God's opinion. And you have passed out of death into life. So that's one view. Some people take that to mean that what Jesus is saying there is that you can lose your salvation. The second view is that the overcoming one or the overcomers are all Christians. MacArthur takes this view, and those of you who have his study Bible or the commentary will note uh, that he takes this position that everyone who's a believer is an overcomer. The very act of believing makes them an overcomer. And he's getting this from 1 John 5.5. 5. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Therefore, faith, not faithfulness, is the primary focus of the position. For example, MacArthur says this. All true believers are overcomers. Who have by God's grace and power overcome the damning power of the evil world system. Christ promises the overcomers at Ephesus that they will eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. That earthly tree was lost due to man's sin in the Garden of Eden, but the heavenly tree of life will last throughout eternity. Thus, the tree of life symbolizes eternal life. I understand that position, and I see how they're articulating that position from that verse. However, I don't agree with that position. There's a third view. This is, would be the view that I hold. Not just me, but men such as Donald Gray Barnhouse, for example. Listen to his explanation, and then we'll get into looking at the view. Barnhouse says, Some have said that eating from the tree of life was equivalent to receiving eternal life, that 1 John 5, 5 passage. But this, most evidently, is a false interpretation. Eternal life is the prerequisite for membership in the true church. Eating of the tree of life is a reward that shall be given to the overcomer in addition to his salvation. His work, built upon the foundation that is Christ Jesus, abides the test of the Lord's appearing, and he receives over and above his entrance into eternal life a place in the heavens in the midst of the paradise of God. So what he's saying here, and this is what I would hold, is that when we're talking about overcoming, there's two kinds of ways to talk about it. One would be positional overcoming, the other would be practical overcoming. That is, 
by the sheer fact in nature, according to 1 John 5, 5, if you're believing or trusting in Christ, then you are an overcoming, or you are an overcoming one by your position in Christ. That is, you've been declared just and or righteous by the Lord Jesus Christ. So you are positionally an overcomer. In a practical sense, you become an overcomer by obedience to Christ after conversion. In terms of positional overcoming, it means to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God that takes place at the moment of your conversion. Practical overcoming in terms of how I live out my daily life is based upon my obedience and willingness to be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5, right? But don't be drunk with wine for that is dissipation. Rather, be filled with the Spirit, present active command. Middle voice, allow yourself to be influenced, dominated, and controlled by the Spirit. Meaning, I do it. You do it. Which means that I can fail to do it. And you can fail to do it. Now, in terms of the practical or positional overcoming, it cannot be undone. Why? Because you can't lose your salvation. In terms of practical overcoming, it can be lost due to fleshly living. That's why I take this third view, the rewards view, that overcoming passage means that these are promises of rewards given to believers to encourage them to be faithful by overcoming the trials and temptations of life through faith in their new life in Christ. Now let me give you some evidences for why I hold and think this view is the most accurate view. First, all Christians are overcomers positionally, but the admonitions that are given to the churches are singular to individuals who overcome practically, meaning he's not writing to the whole ch- he's writing to the whole church, but he's talking to individuals within the church. To Ephesus, he says, to him who overcomes, personal pronoun. In Smyrna, the next church, he who overcomes. Pergamum, to him who overcomes. Thyatira, he who overcomes. Sardis, he who overcomes. These are all singular, not collectively the church. Philadelphia, he who overcomes. Laodicea, which is the final church, he who overcomes. So he's talking about individuals and encouraging them as individuals to turn around and press on. Secondly, the admonitions are given to individuals regarding of deeds or works or regarding deeds or works that they must do. Uh, In Revelation 2, for example, Jesus said, Hold on to what you have, that is your faith, love, and service, and perseverance until I come, and to the one who conquers and who continues in my deeds, with the possibility that you may not continue in those deeds. But he says, If he does continue in those deeds... I will give him authority to rule over the nations. Singular. I will give him or her authority to rule over the nations, depending upon what? Their their practical faithfulness in the everyday Christian walk. And then finally, an argument from reason. To apply these promises to all believers based simply upon their spiritual conversion seems to rob them of their force as a promise. That is, if promises are theirs implicitly by the sheer fact of them being Christians, then why make the appeal? If you're going to get all of this stuff anyway because you're a Christian, then why am I arguing for you to change? Zane Hodges writes, Clearly, the promises to the overcomers are rewards for obedience to the commands of the Lord of the church. As one writer has pointedly observed, a command that everyone keeps is unnecessary. And a reward that everyone receives for a virtue that everyone has is nonsense. Nonsense. 
So what is this reward for faithfulness? Look at verse 7. I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Now this term tree of life is mentioned three times in Revelation 22. In terms of where it is, what it looks like, and what it does. It yields different kinds of fruit, yielding every month, and leaves of the tree which were for healing of the nations. Revelation twenty two fourteen, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of the prophecy, God will take away his part of the tree of life from the holy city which are written in the book. So what is this tree of life? What is the benefit? What is the reward? We're not quite sure. We know, for example, that when we get to heaven, and then when Christ returns, Revelation 19, 11 and following, and we have our resurrected, glorified bodies, you're, you don't need to eat. Death is something you're beyond. So if there's a privilege to the tree of life, that some will receive as a reward, what benefit does it have? No one really knows. They can only speculate. Zane Hodges puts it this way. He said, A person who has Christ within him will not need a physical tree to sustain his spiritual life. But whatever the tree of life has to impart to those who were granted the right to partake of it, this must be truly worth striving for. Almost all of the other promises to overcomers have something of the same undefined but spiritual character. Yet this very vagueness makes the rewards more tantalizing and alluring. The church potentially was running the risk of missing out on these rewards and benefits. Christ was warning them, turn back. Turn back. Be about the task that you should be engaging in. And we know that they did. For example, John wrote this letter in 95 AD. By the time we come some two, three hundred years later, we have church councils that are meeting in Ephesus. So they did turn back. They did do what they were supposed to do. Colonel Abraham Davenport was a senator in the House of Representatives in Connecticut. On May 19, 1780, that was a day that was known at then in that part of the country as one of the most mysterious days that ever happened. During around midday, the sky began to turn black, dark. So much so that people began to be, be afraid. People were lighting candles and putting them in the windows. Businesses were shutting down. Birds all of a sudden got quiet. The legislatures in Connecticut were conducting the people's business when someone asked Colonel Davenport, Sir, there is a rumor that people are afraid and they believe that today is God's judgment day. Should we adjourn and go home to our families? And Davenport thought about it for a moment. And he said, No, we cannot. Why? Because if today is the day of God's judgment, then there is no cause for us to adjourn. If it is the day of God's judgment, then I would prefer to be here doing my duty when he returns. That is the attitude that we all should have in terms of of what we need to be doing to holding on to our first love.
the Lord Jesus Christ. So do your duty. Don't forsake your first love.